is the truth? Where do we find the truth? In the word of God. That's where we find out what truth is. This is where we find out if our theology lines up with God's truth. Well, I'd like to start off today um, just by taking a moment and and wandering around with a cart. You okay with that? You okay if I do that? Any, anybody uh, afraid of me coming to you? Raise your hand now because you just never know what's going to happen, right? Chris, can I use you for a second? Is that all right? Okay, I want to start by giving you this glass, glass of water. Oh, geez. I'm so sorry. Glass of half half glass of water. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, sorry about that. Uh, do you want a glass of water? Sure. Well, you got one. Uh, so um, here's here's the thing: is every once in a while we do things in life where it just is a is an accident. It's a mistake, right? And and when that happens, then Chris has this decision that he needs to make. And and that is, if I'm saying I'm sorry, then is he just going to let me go or is he not, right? Now, let's say that, that this was an accident and you are all beginning to realize it wasn't an accident, right? But let's say this was an accident and Chris just forgave me. And then all of a sudden I came back again and I just started uh, pouring a little more water on him, right? And now... Chris has a different decision to make, doesn't he? Here, you want to hold on to that for a second? I want to take this one because I know it has water in it. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> now, now Chris has a, has a decision that he has to make, right? And, and it's a different decision than what uh, he was making before this. Because before he knew it was an accident, but now he knows that it isn't. And, and so what is he going to do? He knows that I did this. He knows that I should know better, right? You just look at the size of the two of us, and I should know that I should know better, right? And, and, but, but I did it anyways. And so is Chris going to, now what's he going to do? Is he going to hold a grudge, right? Um, we all know that it is not okay to pour water on people who are at church, right? You just don't do that to a member of your church, do you? No, you should be shaking your head no. No, we just don't do that at church. And, 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 and so, so I know that. Chris knows that. So Chris now has a decision to make. Is he going to forgive me? Or is he going to hold a grudge? Is he going to start walking around town and telling people about that stupid pastor at the Benton church who has no idea what he's doing and he hurts people and, and, and he just continues to do it, Right? Is he going to go to a different church, a church that, that doesn't have running water in the building, so he knows that that's not going to happen? Now what happens is if somebody just starts intentionally <laughs> splashing water on Chris the entire time, what happens now? If you're Chris, do you just sit and take it? Apparently. <laughs> Apparently, you just sit and take it and take it and take it, and that person all of a sudden thinks it's okay to just keep doing this? We're all sitting here thinking it's not okay. But the question is, is what's Chris going to do with this? He's going to wait till after the service, you all leave, and, it's, and I'm the only one left here, and you'll be looking for a new preacher next Sunday. right? I mean, that, that's what we're afraid might happen. Uh, Chris, I, I appreciate you being willing to do this. Uh, here's a napkin to clean yourself off with. All right. Um, thank uh, You are more than welcome to, uh, to head on out if you want to change, but I think you look good. You smell better. So, so that's a plus um, for all of us. But, but Chris now has this decision that he has to make. What is he going to do when somebody has done something to hurt him or embarrass him? And what are we going to do? Are we going to just walk out on the person? And the bigger question is, is what is God calling us to do? Because here's the reality of the situation, right? Even the best of relationships that we have, we're going to hurt one another. We're going to do something that, that will make the other person angry. And what are they going to do? And what are you going to do when that happens? Lord, as we move towards hearing from your word, would you please open our eyes to the truth? 
of what it's saying. God, that we would move past our thinking of what's going on and move towards your truth. And then may we step into it. God, as people that want our relationships with one another, our relationships uh, with, with people at home and in our workplaces and in our schools and in our families, to be the best they can be. So God, what can we do? What will you show us today to help us in dealing with our messy relationships? May the words that I share and the things that we all hear be acceptable and pleasing to you, God. For you are our rock and our blessed redeemer. Amen. We are heading to Matthew chapter 18 as Lynn read for us today. And, and Jesus just finished talking about how do we deal with conflicts that we have? How do we deal with, with when somebody hurts us or somebody does something to us uh, in the body of Christ? And it's talking specifically about our, the body of Christ, right? Although the principles work great outside of the body of Christ as well, but how do we deal with that? And, and there's some great answers in there. And, and here's the thing, is, is the answers that are given in the, in the passage before what we're getting to today, it is, it is so life-changing for us and here's the reality. I, I don't think most of the people in the church, myself included, think about that, that passage, when we're trying to deal with times that we've been wronged or have wronged somebody. Because there's this very clear way for us to deal with those conflicts. And often we don't listen to it. So I invite you, after the service, to, to jump into the passage that's before this and to start looking through this, Okay? And, and just see how God calls us to deal with those relationships. But, but Jesus talks about, you know, how to deal with these things. And, and then Peter asks him this question as we get into what we're, what we're, what we're doing today. And, and so it's, the passage starts by saying, then Peter, he comes to Jesus, right? And, and he asks the question, he says, Lord, how many times shall I forgive, right? Shall I, uh, to, uh, the word forgiveness, just so we can have an idea of, of what the word is trying to describe. For, forgive is, is no longer holding something against somebody. It, the most literal way that it can be explained is, is if you were to take your relationship before the situation, the event, the activity, the hurting, the pain happened, and you were to imagine what the relationship was like before that circumstance took place, that's the idea of what forgiveness is. How can I get back to the point where I don't have to be thinking about what just took place. And so have that image in your head when it's talking about forgiveness. So how many times do I have to, to let go of, uh, you know, as best I can, how to let go of what this person has done and, and just go back to the, the way the relationship was fully restored before the circumstance. And, and what Peter says is, is, is this brother or sister who sinned against me. So it's body of Christ. We're talking about fellow Christians, right? So, so this brother or sister sins against me. And then he says up to seven times, right? Right. Which I love the way Lynn shared it. Because he was coming up with a ridiculous number. And what was very, very common uh, in the first century is the rabbis would teach that if somebody did something to you, you're supposed to forgive them. And, you know, like the relationship was before it began, right? And if they did it again, you're supposed to forgive them. If they did it a third time, you're supposed to forgive them. But after three times, you no longer have to forgive the person, right? And, and, and all of a sudden, you can hold that against them for the rest of your life. That's, that's what the, the rabbis, the teachers of the, of the time, were teaching people. So, so, so Peter's coming up to Jesus, who just talked about how we deal with these difficult situations in our relationships. He says, so how, how often should I forgive them? Seven times? I mean, that's twice as much as what the rabbis are teaching, plus one. I mean, I'm coming up with a huge number here. It, it would almost be like you, you go to a restaurant, right? And, and, and you, you get your, your, uh, bill and it's, and it's for 20 bucks, right? So it must be Taco Bell, right? But, so it's 20 bucks, right? But at the done, you, you had somebody who was serving you and, and you decide to give them a $50 tip. Do you know what that feels like? Me neither. Right? But, but, but let's just imagine that, that it was $20 bill and you gave a $50 tip. How good are you going to feel about that? I'm going to feel awesome, right? Because I know that, that, that I've made somebody's day and they're going to walk away feeling good, which means that I feel good and everything's just going to be great and grand and wonderful. I think that's what Peter is doing right here is, is he's trying to come up with a, a number so ridiculous 
He can just pat himself on the back. Oh, so how about we, your followers, Jesus, forgive people seven times? Crazy, right? And we all know how Jesus responds to this, don't we? Jesus answers, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Some, some of your Bibles will say, or 70 times seven. It, it, it's like, it's like you, you imagine they're all around a table, right? And they're playing cards. And, and, and Peter says, I bid seven. And Jesus says, oh yeah, well, I multiply that times 70, right? You, you think that you're all in, but I am all in on this. It's, it's, it's kind of the image of what Jesus is saying. I want you to forgive people 77 times. Peter thought his number was ludicrous. And Jesus says, that's nothing compared to how I want you to treat other people. And I want you to forgive them and forgive them and forgive them to the point where you just can't keep track anymore of how often you forgive them. It's kind of like if you were to imagine going home and seeing this, right? Nobody likes to see this at home. It's laundry. Now, this is the laundry of of my kid who does athletics. So I encourage you not to come up here after the service is done. All right? And but but just imagine the laundry that is piling up for you at home. And here's the question: the laundry starts piling up. What do you eventually do? You wash it, right? I hope you wash it. Because we certainly ought not to be wandering around in dirty clothes all the time. That would be crazy. And so we wash the clothes, and then we put them on again, and they get dirty. We throw them in the laundry basket, and then what do we do after it fills up? We wash it. Now, does the laundry ever get to a point where we no longer have to wash laundry anymore? The answer is no. Feel free to say it. We don't want to be the Benton church that stinks, right? So feel free to say it. No, the laundry always will need to be washed as soon as it gets dirty. And this is the point that Jesus is trying to make. You're trying to come up with a a number so you can get to the point where you do not have to show mercy or grace to other people. And Jesus is saying, that's ridiculous. We continue to forgive. It's like he's saying, it's like laundry. If it gets dirty, we wash it. If it gets messy, we clean it up. It's not seven times what you think is this great number of of you showing grace and mercy to the world. But it's way beyond even what you could count. And he says, forgive. And that's the idea. He's saying, forgive. I want you to forgive and I want you to keep forgiving. Every time you find something dirty in your life, somebody does something to you, forgive and keep forgiving. I assume Jesus uh, looked at the people and said, they're not getting this (laughs) because he starts to tell this story. He starts to tell this parable. And in the parable, what he says is, is therefore the kingdom of heaven is like. Now, I just want to stop, you know, the whole idea that what we often hear is is, is, is a heavenly understanding of, of things that we do on earth. Um, but, but let me try to clarify that even just a little bit more for us. When it talks about the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God and what it's like, I, I believe what Jesus is trying to do is trying to help each and every one of us understand how am I supposed to live and bring uh, the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven to earth right now in the way that I live. And so, so what, what Jesus now is saying is he's trying to do is he's trying to help his followers understand this is how we live. The followers of Jesus, this is how we live when it comes to forgiveness. And so he starts telling the story and he says the kingdom of heaven is like the king who wanted to settle his accounts with his servants. Now a king in the first century, they, they were the ruler over an area and they had authority to do anything and everything. So you, so this person who was completely in charge and, and, and he, you know, there's a bunch of people around that he's given money to or given resources to and, and now he's calling the debt to be paid. 
right? It's time for them to pay back the things that was given to them. And so he's wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And, and as he began, right, the, the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Now, now we need to understand the significance of the amount of money that this is talking about. Some of your versions will say talents, 10,000 talents. But, but the, the thing that we need to understand first and foremost is, is back then in the first century, in the Greek language, there was not a number larger than 10,000. And so the first thing that we need to realize is, is that what Jesus is trying to help people um, understand is that there is no number greater than what I'm talking about right now. Okay, And so he's saying 10,000 bags of gold or 10,000 talents. So what's a talent or how much is a bag of gold? Well, well let's, uh, let's talk about a denarii because we're going to be getting to that here in, in a little bit. But a denarii or a piece of silver, which is what was read today, is actually one day's wages. Okay, so be thinking about that. So And, and it takes 6,000 denarii in order to make a single bag of gold, right? So how long does it take it in order for the regular Joe to, to all of a sudden amass a, a bag of gold? 16 and a half years of, of nonstop work in order for us to, to get that amount of money, assuming that you don't spend on anything else, right? So now it takes 16 and a half years to get one bag of gold, and this person somehow, some way, owes the king 10,000 bags of gold. Well, how long is it going to take him to, to pay this back if you were to work every day of his life? Only 16,500 years. That's it. And then he'll be able to pay it back. What's Jesus' point here? That this person owes a ridiculous amount. We have no idea how he ended up in this situation, but he is there. And, and, and he cannot pay this back. There is no way he possibly can. Okay, so do you have the idea of what's going on? 10,000 bags of gold, 16,500 years of work. And since he was not able to pay the master, what do you think the master does? I, I came across this quote from Heinrich Heine, which may be the best name that I've come across in a while in my reading, right? Heinrich Heine, he is a poet, and, and he uh, once said this. He said, my nature is the most peaceful in the world. All I ask is a simple cottage, a decent bed, good food, some flowers in the front of my window, and a few trees beside my door. Then, if God wanted to make me completely happy... He would let me enjoy the spectacle of six or seven of my enemies dangling from those trees. I would forgive them of all the wrongs that they had done me from the bottom of my heart, for we must forgive my enemies, but not until they're hanged. And I think that this is often where we get caught. where somebody does something to us, and we just can't let go. But Jesus doesn't start with what somebody has done to us. Jesus starts with what the servant has done to the king. Remember, this is, this is one of those parables about the kingdom of heaven. And so he, Since he was not able to pay, what does the master do? does God do with the sin that we have in our lives that we can't pay for? Now remember, this is a story, and he's trying to make a point of how we are supposed to live in this world, right? So the master orders that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. All right, so, so that's now the expectation is you have to sell everything and I'm going to take your entire family and I'm going to throw them into what's called debtor's prison and, and you're going to have to work and everything that you earn while you're in prison goes to me. You, your wife, and your kids. And if for some strange reason you end up having more kids or your kids have kids while they're in prison, they're going to have to keep in there and keep trying to pay it off until all 16,500 years of debt is paid. 
I mean, that, that's the picture of what happened. That's the picture. You made the penalty. You have to deal with the circumstances, the consequences, the results of the thing that you did. So that's what the king is saying. That's the part of, of, of sin. That's the part of the debt that we owe is, is there's this consequence. Something has to be done for it. And here's what the man does. At this, the servant, he fell to his knees before him, and he says this. He says, be patient with me, he begged. I'll pay back everything. Well, let me ask you a question. Can this guy pay back everything? There is no way. Why doesn't he ask the king to forgive the debt? Because the debt is so ridiculous that he thinks it would be ridiculous for the king to forgive it. That's my guess. Or he is so arrogant, so confident that the world revolves around what he has the ability to and to not do, that he can make the decisions of how to figure this out as we go forward, which is also ridiculous. Because he can't pay off the debt of the king. Please forgive me. Be patient with me. Or he doesn't say, please forgive me. He says, be patient with me. I will pay back everything. Listen to what the king does. Because this becomes an image of what God has done for us and our sin that separates us from him. The servant's master says, took pity on him. The word literally means from the depths of our bowels, which sounds really gross. It's a gross, messy day. We're talking about messy relationships. But have you ever experienced something so emotional that you felt it in your gut? It's impacting you so much that in the, your insides feel different? I, I have my guesses you have. And now the image is of a king looking at the servant who has no ability to pay this off. And in his gut, he chooses compassion instead of consequence. It says he took pity on him. He canceled the debt. The debt is gone. And then he let him go. So he took compassion, right? He said, you no longer owe the debt. And he lets him go. You need to understand what let him go means. Because in the language, this is the same word that, that is used to, to talk about um, a, a complete block, a complete ending of something. This is the word that they use uh, for, for, the word, for the word divorce that we use. And so, so what it's saying is, is we, there's going to be this severing. There's this clear ending of what has gone on prior to this and what has gone on before, right? I, 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 in a sense, I am divorcing this situation from your life, and you are now completely free to go. Nothing is going to hold you back as you now move forward. Can you hear the forgiveness in that? The compassion, I am not going to hold anything against you. Your past, it's been forgiven. And I am going to choose to have compassion on you by not allowing the situation, the circumstance, the hurt, the pain that you caused to have happen to be a part of your life anymore or my life. That's what it's saying. This is how God treats us when it comes to our sin. When he says, I, I, you know, you come to me and I'm going to have compassion and I'm going to forgive you and I'm not going to hold that against you so that we can be in relationship with one another and we could move forward in this kingdom of heaven on this earth. I can help you to become what I want you to be. So let's let go of that thing of the past. Let's divorce it from our thoughts. Let's divorce it from our lives. Remember that God forgave you and that God forgives you. That's what Jesus is trying to let him know. What we come before him is, is ridiculous. We can't make up for it. There is no way in the world we can make up for our sin and all of a sudden become perfect. The only way that happens is if there's a sacrifice that takes place, Christ enters in, dies on the cross, 
raises again, takes the penalty of our sin away. And that debt that would take us 16,500 years to pay off, that debt that we can't pay, Christ has done. And God says, let's divorce ourselves from the past and let's move forward together. Isn't that a beautiful picture of what God has done for us? God's forgiveness for us. And now you heard the story uh, as it continues on. We know that this servant now leaves, and he's probably super excited, right? He, know, he doesn't owe all that ridiculous amount of money that he ended up with, right? And it says, so the servant went out, right? But when he went out, he found a fellow servant. So this is another person who serves the king, right? He finds this fellow servant who owes him a hundred, or who owes him one hundred silver coins. Now, what did I say a silver coin was? Or some of your versions say denarii. I said it was a denarii, right? One silver coin was a denarii. A denarii was a day's wages. So this person owes this other servant about three months worth of work. Now, again, it's a crazy amount of money. How did he end up getting that far into debt? I don't know, right? But it is something that we could realistically work off if we came up with some sort of plan. And so he owes them this hundred silver coins. But when the servant, sorry, I feel like I'm missing something. Yeah, it goes, but when that servant went out, he found uh, one of the fellow servants who owed him 100 silver coins. And, and now, so the, then the new question comes, what are you going to do? You, you see, realize what God has done for you and how he's divorced you from your past. And, and now you and I get to walk with Christ. What are you going to do now when somebody owes you? What are you going to do? Kind of reminds me of the, the, the story, because this is how I think a lot of us respond. The story of, of the little boy who's, who's got this angry, sad, painful look on his face, and you find out that he's sitting on a bumblebee, right? And you ask the kid, why in the world are you sitting on the bumblebee? And as the kid's answer is, well, I figure I'm hurting him more than he's hurting me. And the answer is, is you're both hurting each other, <laughs> which I think is the point that Jesus starts to get into here. He says, uh, so owed him a hundred silver coins. So what do you do in the situation when somebody has hurt you or somebody owes you, somebody's in debt to you? Well, here's what this guy did. Now, again, this is a story, but it's a story trying to help us to understand how we typically live as followers of Jesus and to cause us to think about how he wants us to live. He grabbed him and began to choke him and said, pay back what you owe me, he demanded. And again, what this servant does is the exact same thing that, that he did before the king, right? And, and, and when he does, he says, you know, I'll pay you back. Be patient with me. I'll pay you back. Except the difference is, is this guy takes his, his fellow servant, his friend or whatever he is, and he throws him in debtor's prison for three months of a debt. And now he has to pay it back. And, th you know, he has to keep working until that all, he gets all that money back, and then he'll be released. You've done something where you owe me. You've harmed me. You've hurt me. I don't like what happened. And I am going to hold that against you until you pay me back. Some of us do that, don't we? With the painful things that we've experienced. And a part of me thinks, not only do I get it, it seems reasonable, especially because some of us really have been hurt by other people. Some of the scars are, are significant in our lives. I'm not trying to belittle that. But I am trying to show us what God is calling us to do, even in those situations. How are we going to respond? This guy throws him into prison. He says, I don't care. It's like he didn't even think about the forgiveness that God or the king had given him when he turns and he looks at other people. He throws him into prison. Other people see this. They see what this guy had done. And they go to the king in the story. They said, king, he's treating other people in not the same way that you treated him. You need to be aware of that. The king calls him in. And says to him, shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had on 
you. And I know it's hard. But what Jesus is trying to help we, his followers, to understand is holding on to the pain of something that has happened to us in the past is only going to drag us down. Now, I'm not saying that if somebody has hurt you in some sort of way that, that, that they should not have done, that you just allow yourself to go back into that original situation. I'm not saying that at all. I mean, Chris obviously sat and took all the water that I threw at him because he knew it was coming. I probably owe him a burger. I'm not saying that if somebody repeatedly does something to you that you just have to sit there and take it. I don't think that's what God is saying either. But I think what God is saying is, don't hold on to it. Divorce yourself from the circumstance. So that not only can the other person move forward, the other person might not even care about it. But it's so you can move forward. I mean, who's the king dealing with here? He's dealing with the servant who's having a hard time with something that somebody else did to him. The king's not dealing with the person who's in prison right now. The king's dealing with the person who threw him in prison. Because that person can't let go of what's going on. Do you know what these are? My guess is a lot of us do, right? They're barnacles. And a barnacle is this living organism that, that, that lives in the sea, right? And, and it has what's called a concrete gland, which is crazy, right? And, and what it does is it'll, it'll eventually attach itself to something. Sometimes you'll see them on, the, on whales, uh, but oftentimes you'll see them on ships. And, and when they do, they, they, they get themselves on there so securely that it's like concrete. And, and then they feed off of that area. Right? And, and so eventually you could get a bunch of these barnacles that are on the bottom of, of, of your boat or a ship, you know, this is if we were at the ocean, right? That these things can happen. And, and, and if you just keep them on there, it can begin to impact how well the ship moves. You get enough barnacles on there, and, and all of a sudden you're using 50% more fuel just to get to wherever you're going. So what do you need to do with the barnacles? You got to get rid of them. And it's not easy work. And I think this is what the king is trying to help this person understand. When he said, you need to have mercy on other people. It's not easy. But I was willing to have it on you. I was willing to forgive you. Compassion. And divorce what you had done in the past to with how I'm going to see you now. I invite you to put in the work to clean off the boat so you are not being worn down as you walk through life. Because that's what happens. If you don't forgive somebody, you continue to hold on to that circumstance. If you're just waiting till they end up on the tree and you can see them hanged as you forgive them, it means you're just holding on to the situation the entire time. Let go of the situation so it doesn't drag you down. Can I let you know, uh, it's, it's been a few years, but I used to love playing golf. Uh, you know, it's, it's one of those fun things that you can do with a group of people. Uh, but, but here's what I learned, is my golf game significantly improved the day I learned about a mulligan. You know what a mulligan is? A mulligan is if you make a terrible shot, right? Then, then some, you know, the, then either you look at somebody else or somebody else looks at you. This is social golf, not competitive golf, right? Never done competitive golf. Somebody looks at you and says, "Well, why don't you just take a mulligan, right? Why don't you just put another ball down and try the shot again?" And so you tee off again, or you're on the green and you're putting away, and, and it just gets this close to the hole and it doesn't go in. You, you think you lined it up right, and somebody says, take them all again. Try it again. This is what I want to invite us to do today, is to consider taking a mulligan. Consider today maybe asking God for a mulligan. 
God, I realize that I haven't really been living the way that you wanted me to, especially in regards to how I treat one another, treat others, and forgiving them and holding on to grudges. God, can I take a mulligan? God will say yes. Will you help me to try again? I encourage you maybe to offer a mulligan to somebody else. Chris, sorry I got you wet today. Can I take a mulligan? He said yes, I'm safe after church. Whew, that was a close call. I can stop sweating. Offer somebody a mulligan. Somebody who has hurt you unintentionally. Sometimes we still hold grudges. Intentionally seems more understandable why we would hold a grudge. And just forgive them. I invite you to consider offering yourself a mulligan. Because we have a hard time letting go, don't we, sometimes, of the things that we have done when we've hurt somebody, when we have wronged somebody. We're still holding on to the pain that we caused. I encourage you to give yourself a mulligan. It's biblical. Not necessarily okay in tournament golf, right? But it's biblical that God offers it. As a matter of fact, I, I want you to—I I, I seriously want you to do this. I want you to take one hand and hold it out and clinch your fist really tight, right? If you're willing to do this, just just take your hand and hold it and clinch it really, really tight. And now imagine that this is the thing that you are holding on to. Okay, It could be the pain that somebody else has caused you. It could be the pain that you have caused somebody else or your realization that you have not been right with God and hold on to that really tightly. And now just let it go. Seems super simple, doesn't it? Almost seems too easy, doesn't it? But this is what God is offering us. And it's not that we can continue on doing whatever we've done before because what Jesus is doing is to inviting us into a different life in this world. One where our forgiveness, our letting go of the hurts that we've experienced, the hurts that we've caused, or just the sin in our lives in regards to Christ, we can just let it go. Say, Jesus, I know that I've sinned. I know that I've been holding on to this thing. Today I let it go. Please forgive me for what I've done. And I choose to live in your kingdom the way that you want me to live. Jesus, I've been holding a grudge against so-and-so for the longest time because of what they've done to me. They have hurt me so bad. Today I let it go. I'm not going to hang on to the pain. I'm going to move in the direction you are calling me to. Jesus, I've been beating myself up for years for what I've done. Today I let go and trust you with my life. Can we be people that will allow ourselves a mulligan today? Father, thank you for the truth of your word. Man, this is a challenging one. I'm guessing a lot of us will struggle with this. But your word shares with us that we can let go of these things and we can forgive people. And so today we choose to walk in that. God, as we let go, help us. Help our memories to begin to fade about these things. Not that we allow ourselves to just continue to be hurt, God, but help our memories of the pain to be placed in your lap and that we can move and live the way that you are calling us to. And God, help our relationships to be all that you want them to be. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you for watching this week's message. We hope you found it both encouraging and helpful. If you did, please click the like button and share with your friends. If you want to hear when new messages are posted, please subscribe to The Benton Church. We also invite you to join us on site for worship. We're located in Benton, Kansas, just east of Wichita. Our Sunday services start at 1030 and our doors are open to everyone. 
For more information, please check out our website at thebittenchurch.org. What do you know about God? He loves us. He died for our sins. He helps us. He's powerful. And he loves you.